Good day, everyone, and welcome to the IPB Focus on Glaucoma webinar for the Africa region. My name is Simon Day, and I'm the IPB Program Coordinator for the Africa region, and I'll be chairing this webinar today. As part of uh, the IPB activities to mark World Glaucoma Week 2019, IPB is presenting four webinars to cover the regions of North, Af North America, Africa, Southeast Asia, and China, Western Pacific, for members and partnering organizations to take part in during the week of the 10th to the 16th of March. Also, last night, IPB uh, held a lecture uh, in London, uh, a focus on glaucoma lecture, which had um, a very good attendance uh, online with over a thousand people registering for it. I'd like to say that for this particular webinar, the Africa webinar, we have 129 registered, which um, still uh, by, by our regional webinar standards is one of the highest numbers we've ever had. So Africa keeps setting records there, which we're very proud of. A bit of housekeeping to begin with, uh, this webinar is scheduled to be one hour long. Uh, that will consist of a guided discussion from our presenters uh, on improving services for glaucoma in Africa. Um, then we'll have time for, uh, to take questions from the audience. Uh, we do like these sessions to be participatory, and so uh, at the end, we'll set aside some time. So if, if the, the audience have any questions, please uh, type those questions in the chat box. You can find that chat box in the right-hand panel of your screen, um, and you can post the questions there. When you do so, uh, we always find it interesting to know who we are engaging with. So if you could introduce yourselves and tell us where you logged in from, we'd appreciate that. Similarly, if you find that you're having any technical issues, please send us a message via the chat box and we'll see what we can do about that. We have, in fact, received um, some questions in the lead up to this webinar some, from some rather eager um, uh, listeners. So our presenters have included those and they'll tackle them during their presentation. Uh, it's, it, it's usually a good idea to close down all other web applications, such as your Google, your Outlook, your Skype, just to ensure that you have a better quality of call. And of course, if you have headphones, please use those. We'll be recording this webinar, <coughs> excuse me, and it'll be uploaded to the IPB website, um, and we will send around a link for this in the coming days. And that will also include the slides, which you'll be seeing uh, during this presentation. Finally, uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, there'll be a survey that's sent around. It'll come from the GoToMeeting uh, software. And uh, that's just to, to request your feedback on the webinar, um, because we always like to learn a little bit and, 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 and make so, so that we can ensure that the offerings are the best possible. At this point, I'd like to introduce our lecturers. Uh, firstly, we have uh, Dr. Fatima Kiari, who is working with Light for the World on their glaucoma program in Africa. She also happens to be the IPB uh, co-chair, IPB Africa co-chair for Anglophone West Africa. Then we have Dr. Adeola uh, on Onakoyo, who is a professor and head of the Department of Ophthalmology uh, uh, at the University of Lagos. She is also the chair of the Glaucoma Society of, of uh, Nigeria and specializes in the management of all aspects of glaucoma diagnosis and treatment. Finally, we have Dr. Heiko Philippin, who works for CBM, uh, and his interests are glaucoma surgery and delivering glaucoma care in low-income settings. <clears throat> As you know, the theme of this webinar is glaucoma, and 10 to 16 uh, March is Glaucoma Week, and IPB is partnered, partnering with organizations and experts in glaucoma care to draw to draw a spotlight on the third leading cause of blindness. IPB is launching a new campaign, Focus on Glaucoma, and we're making the, we, we are marking this week with a series of activities, lectures, webinars, blog posts, and more. So keep an eye out on our social media outlets for more information. Glaucoma is a group of conditions characterized by optic nerve damage and loss of field of vision. The IPB Atlas tells us that uh, in 2015, the prevalence of glaucoma was 0.95%. Uh, it's a disease which is unco un uncommon amongst people under the age of 40, but its prevalence uh, increases with age. And we, this, is, this is serious as we have to consider the aging population. The UN estimated that in 2015, 12% of the population were made up of people over the age of 60. But by 2050, this figure will have increased to 22%. 
the frightening thing about glaucoma is that many people are not diagnosed until they've become completely blind, and that's particularly the case in Africa. At this point, I'd like to hand over to our, to our lecturers, um, who, as I mentioned, will not be uh, giving conventional presentations, but rather will engage in uh, a, a guided discussion. So um, over to our presenters. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm Fatima Kiari. I'll be guiding the discussion on glaucoma. Thank you, Simon, for the for the introduction. Yeah, I'd like to share my um, screen now, please. Okay, so we would actually be talking about um, improving services to prevent glaucoma blindness in Africa. This time we use the word prevent because um, to prevent blindness, because we are gearing towards, you know, preventing the blindness from glaucoma and also improving the treatment of those that we know have glaucoma. Um, asking for early diagnosis, it's a bit too much at this time. So we're going to take it bite size. Um, so the main thing we're talking about is big, beat invisible glaucoma. And we say that everybody matters. I would like to call on uh, Professor Adiola Onakoya. She's a professor of ophthalmology and the president of the Glaucoma Society of Nigeria. Yes. Um, hello, Fatima. Professor, yes, I yes. know you're big in saying everybody matters in glaucoma. Can you please say a little more about this? Um, yes, everybody matters in glaucoma. If we think of glaucoma, we know glaucoma, as controversial as it is, um, from top to bottom, it's all about everybody. Nobody really is spared. If you think of glaucoma, think of the pathophysiology. I mean, as one ages, uh, you get glaucoma if you live long enough. And we we'll talk about our patients who are affected and even talking about all the stakeholders in healthcare, the ophthalmologists, the optometrists, the allied health workers, everyone should be involved. Uh, we also do know that majority of the specialists, even the ophthalmologists, are concentrated in the urban cities, in the urban centers in sub-Saharan Africa. And the aim really is to take healthcare, to take glaucoma care, to the rural unreached areas. That is why I said everybody matters. In the rural unreached areas, we do have community eye health workers who are working there. And I feel that teaching them to do simple tests and teaching them to identify some, it's late stages they probably will be able to pick. We also do know that with telemedicine, with smartphones that we have now, if we teach them, they are then able to go into those rural unreached areas, take pictures, and then check visual acuities. We'll give them level of visual acuity that they probably would have to refer to probably a higher health center. That is talking about horizontal integration. Or we just do a vertical integration where we have supervising uh, district hospitals, general hospitals, or tertiary institutions at that community level. And even including the community, the people in the community, you know, engaging them, allowing them to participate in the health screening, be part of it, teach them, let them take over, let them own it, let them own the health education bit of it, let them help in their awareness. And I think that that's where, you know, everybody is involved and all of us together, we can beat the invisible glaucoma. So that's why I said, everybody matters. Both the patient, the doctors, the optometrists, we are all involved in it and at different levels, you know, working at the different levels of healthcare, primary, secondary, and tertiary, and everybody in um, all CADA, whether the senior CADA or the low CADA, everybody is important and everybody is involved. And all the people with uh, family members suffering from glaucoma, we would also involve them, get them involved, let them understand the disease so that the management of the patient will be better. Okay, so, so um, what about the secondary level? You talked about glaucoma 
specialists and secondary level and tertiary level. At the secondary level. The, uh, yes, at the secondary level, we are going to work more with the optometrists. There are ophthalmologists practicing at secondary level, but you also work more with the ophthalmic nurses, even allied uh, eye care workers at that level, because some district hospitals or sub-secondary care centers are still very close to the primary health care centers. So you have the locator of staff working there. And we can still teach at that level. You can have the optometrist helping in the screening, the case detection of glaucoma, just teaching them endoscopy to identify cupped discs. We know going by the ISGO classification, we might have to move up a bit to 0 0.6, 0 0.7 for them, because that's a lot easier to identify. So it's a lot easier for them to identify. Being in the forefront, you can have the ophthalmic nurses you know, going into areas where you don't have ophthalmologists, and you can even have them, you know, being in charge of some departments, which will be overseen by uh, either a tertiary hospital or a higher grade um, general hospital where you have ophthalmologists. Okay, um, thank you, Adiola. Um, well, I have the next slide on. Emma, can you please put on the next slide for us um, and the next one? Okay. Okay. Okay, so yes. this... Uh, yes, the next slide. Gone okay. It. We've, we've talked about this. Um, I just found this picture very interesting. Adiola, can you tell us a, bit, a little bit more on that? Yes, this is all about glaucoma patients. We know that even at WGA level, we have World Glaucoma Patients Association. So that was what prompted me you know, to get some of our glaucoma patients together. And we have Glaucoma Patient Care Initiative, which is a body of glaucoma patients and what they do is they meet every two months. And during that meeting, they teach themselves glaucoma. They, you know, somebody who is suffering from a disease is better, um, is, at a, is in a better position to talk about it as somebody who is not suffering from it. And, you know, they get educated about it. And they also yeah. teach, encourage others on the need for them to be persistent with their treatment, on the need to be compliant, and also encouraging other patients who probably might have been offered surgery for them to uptake uh, surgery, you know, because okay, we know that- thank you. Um, we, will, we will talk about a little bit more about encouraging people. So um, just to, uh, to remind us again, a brief definition of glaucoma. What is glaucoma really? And um, why is it important to focus on it? So glaucoma is a group of diseases that have a common endpoint. And um, that endpoint is optic neuropathy. That optic neuropathy shows up as characteristic structural damage to the optic nerve, which we can see um, either through direct, you know, visualization of the optic nerve or through photographs or through um, sophisticated machines such as the OCT. And then of course, there's also visual dysfunction, which is um, a characteristic of glaucoma. Um, just to remind ourselves again, how big is glaucoma? In African populations, is actually the commonest cause of irreversible total blindness. Accounts for about 16% of blindness, most of which, you know, is avoidable blindness. 85% um, is open angle glaucoma. And for example, in Nigeria, only about 5% of those with glaucoma are aware that they have the disease. And then more men are affected, both in the glaucoma and in the blindness from glaucoma. And um, there are more Africans, as, you know, as, especially Blacks, that are affected with glaucoma. So the um, preference, uh, glaucoma actually occurs all over the world. But as you can see from this graph, the African um, population is more at risk, about 4% of 
those aged 40 years and above have open and mostly open angle glaucoma. Um, glaucoma occurs in China, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia is mostly angle closure glaucoma. So, um, Professor Adiola, I'd like to again ask you, you know, as a clinician um, specialist in glaucoma, how do you see glaucoma patients present to you in the clinic and at what stages? Well, talking about patients' presentation in the clinic, it's usually very pathetic, you know, on a day, you know, you're sitting in the clinic and 10 patients walk in as new patients. And out of these 10 patients, seven are glaucoma patients. And out of the seven glaucoma patients, five of them already have advanced visual loss. That is the kind of glaucoma we see here in this environment. And sometimes two of them probably would have lost vision in one eye hand movements or light perception or, you know, very advanced uh, visual acuity loss, not to even talk about the visual field loss that they have. So majority of our patients, about 80%, would have lost some useful vision before coming in. And it's because of the awareness and the fact that people feel the visual acuity alone is all that is required. And you and I know that by the time we rely on visual acuity, it's usually too late. By the time a patient loses vision from visual acuity point of view, by that time, of course, 80 to 90% of the field is gone. So that is the stage at which our patients come in. So rather advanced. Okay, so that is why we would like to introduce the conceptual framework for the care pathway. We know that... Um, this is where we want our glaucoma patients to be. We would like um, our patients to focus. We would like to focus on patients and would like to see what we can do and um, what the patient needs. So to join the care pathway, we would like patients to be, you know, to come from not knowing glaucoma to access to care and then all the way to diagnosis, accepting and maintaining their treatment with the main aim of preventing further vision loss and blindness from glaucoma. I'll ask you again, Professor Adiola Onakoya. Um, we mentioned that the lack of awareness of glaucoma is a huge problem, not only in Africa, but also the world over. Looking at our situation, how do you think we can increase awareness of the disease? Well, Professor there are several, Adiola? yes. There are several ways in which you can increase the awareness. Number one, we can start even in our clinics, ensure that we have educational pamphlets, we should hold health talks, talk about glaucomas. In fact, now we can even have recorded messages, you know, in all our clinics, we have televisions, and when patients come in, all they are watching is the home videos. We can put um, awareness messages, you know, educational videos on glaucoma there. And beyond that, like we're doing now, World Glaucoma Week, we have awareness, all over the radio, all over the television, and even in religious places, we have people going there. But beyond that, we need to go to where people are. We need to go into the marketplaces to create awareness for the women, because those women will never leave their shops. They will never leave their wares in the markets to come to the hospital. So we have to go there, you know, to create awareness. And you have to, probably would have to go to the farm and go to the villages, go to the town halls, and to, if we're able to do this effectively, we would need to include the community leaders, you know, get community leaders, educate them. They can even own it and do it themselves. And even beyond that, we can also make use of glaucoma patients. And that is the essence of the Glaucoma Patients Association. You know, through them, you know, through word of mouth, they can spread the message onto people, especially the first degree relative that we know have a higher risk of developing the disease. So if we're able to do this, you know, we'll get many more people involved. And through that, you know, the awareness level can go higher. So I think um, we need to um, get people to take responsibility of their eye health and, you know, generally of their health. So health promotion. And then we also want to strive towards earlier detection of glaucoma. So um, just expand a little bit more on the opportunistic case finding and how can we get people to have regular eye exam? 
Professor yes. Adjana, um, please. Yeah, on opportunistic case finding, well, let me start from the clinic again. You know, several people walk in by the time they are 35, 38, because of presbyopia. They come for change of glasses. Of course, during that time, we can do fundoscopy, ensure that the optic nerve head is not diseased. Also, any patients whatsoever, any patient at all that comes to the clinic for any other, you know, uh, condition, we should do fundoscopy for everybody. And then beyond that, when we go on awareness creation, probably we are going into community either to screen for diabetic retinopathy or any other ocular disorders, we should do fundoscopy. You know, at every opportunity, we should seize it and do fundoscopy for everybody we come across, especially people that are 35 years and above. And it is also important for us to educate people so let them know that when you are around this age, because of the, um, the way glaucoma is, anybody can actually develop it. And it's not only people who have family members, because we know that being of African descent is a, is a risk factor, and advancing age is a risk factor. So you already have two risk factors once you're getting older. Yes. So I Yes, so I think quite correct. Yes. So I think, um, especially like people that go for presbyopia testing, I think it's mandatory yes. that they have to have their pop disc ratio checked, right? And family members of glaucoma patients, that is very important. And through them, we can still also spread the news, you know, that people should get their eyes checked. For instance, if you see, if you examine the eye of a first degree relative, and that individual happens to have glaucoma, of course, it will be quick to bring other family members to be sure that they don't go the same pathway their family member has gone. So I think using first degree reality and the opportunity of press by OPI when people come in will give us a greater yield. Okay, um, Heiko. Yeah. <clears throat> I yeah. know you are quite specific on how you diagnose glaucoma. It is a chronic disease. To be really sure of the diagnosis, what are the key issues involved in the diagnosis? Heiko, can you please tell us more about this? Yeah. So once a patient has been identified as Adiola was um, alluding to, um, we we need to know is it really glaucoma um, or not, which is um, not always easy to answer. So it's typically done then by an ophthalmologist, maybe. A glaucoma specialist in a secondary or tertiary center that uh, I think depends on on the respective country how how they define secondary and tertiary care and the equipment needed or um, basically follows the definition you mentioned already plus um, possible risk factors or comorbidities um, first of all we start of course also with the history um, to know how how did it start? When did the patient notice anything? If if the, he noticed anything himself, family history, um, any other factors uh, which could um, contribute to glaucoma, and then following the definition, we we want to check for structural damage of the optic nerve. Um, as Aniola was mentioning already, uh, either with direct ophthalmoscopy or slit lamp. Um, indirect ophthalmoscopy with a 90D or a 66D, um, which gives us the one-to-one -one magnification uh, on the slit lamp measurement device. Um, then it's, if possible, a documentation of the optic nerve is always good. You can you can uh, determine the CD range, cut disc ratio, or um, the disc damage likelihood a score uh, of George Spade, uh, TDLS. Um, you can make a drawing, if possible, a fundus um, image is always helpful as a reference uh, for future examinations. If possible, uh, some centers also um, have an OCT um, to document um, the optic nerve, not necessarily also to, to do the diagnosis, but just to add another piece of the puzzle um, of the diagnosis. So then the second area which um, needs to be examined is the uh, visual function. Um, as, as the glaucoma also mentioned, there's typically uh, visual 
this function in glaucoma, so starting with visual acuity, um, as Adeola said, um, for Nigeria, I, I, or we have the same experience in East Africa. I, I worked uh, for three years in Kenya, nine years uh, in Tanzania, and it was a similar challenge that a lot of patients come already blind on at least one eye, if not both eyes from glaucoma, and I know from many other colleagues, they are facing similar challenges. So in these advanced or severe cases, visual acuity is already um, reduced. Um, if cases are rather moderate or advanced, also a visual field can be done if available, Humphrey or Octopus. And there are actually also new developments like tablet-based or um, laptop-based visual field tests. Um, I, I know of some studies in Tanzania which are testing these new devices, so hopefully in the near future there will be also uh, alternative visual field um, devices available. Then, of course, the main risk factor, as sort of the, the third uh, domain we want to check, is intraocular pressure, which is typically um, increased, not as you all know, not always, and it it always can be misleading, especially in advanced glaucoma with um, advanced damage of the chamber of the chamber angle. You can have very high fluctuations of IOP. The patient might have a pressure of 30 one day, and then he comes back the next day, pressure is 20, or within even within hours, the pressure can fluctuate a lot. Or of course, we have normal tension glaucoma, and so the pressure. It's important, but we, we can't rely on, on checking pressure alone, of course, to um, specify the diagnosis. And then I would say as the fourth important um, part of the a diagnostic procedure is um, the gonioscopy, just to rule out um, any secondary um, causes for the glaucoma, neovascularizations, um, old trauma and so on, which is relatively common in the region. And also, of course, to differentiate between narrow angle and open angle. And we, we do not really have solid, much solid data, but probably in in the Africa region, if, if we can uh, cut across the whole continent, it, it, we mostly have open angle glaucoma, but this is, I, I guess, variable. Uh, depending on the respective reach, then we will probably also know more about this in the future. So, in summary, I think yes, this I is call, uh, um, the whole procedure. Yeah. Yeah. I would um, like to ask you a question from um, which was sent to us by Robin Finlay from the UK. Mm -hmm. He's asking you specifically, um, Heiko. He says, "I am delighted that you are holding this discussion. My question is." What progress has been made in ensuring that all ophthalmologists and ophthalmic clinical officers where they are uh, practicing in um, sub-Saharan Africa have access to reliable tonometry and visual field testing devices? So in other words, what are we doing really to ensure that um, these um, equipment are available where they're needed? Yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Robin, for this excellent question. This is. It is an important aspect that I remember when he brought us um, years ago in Sabatia Hospital visual field machines, and he's, he's very eager to um, continue doing so. Uh, and I, I would say, answering his question, since then a lot has happened, and I I know from from us at KCMC we we are very well equipped. I know from colleagues in Dar es Salaam, Nairobi, and so on, they are very well equipped. However, still um, there are fluctuations. Um, I'm mainly uh, speaking of, of East Africa, where where I have where maybe my experience from, and so there is still also need in in some centers for equipment. But I think it it shouldn't stop us from diagnosing glaucoma, and um, yeah, equipment. Is, is one thing and training is also very important. Uh, maintenance of the equipment is a very important aspect which ideally should come as a, a complete package and that um, clinicians are trained to use the equipment that maintenance is 
organized um, to to keep equipment alive, to uh, also facilitate the procurement of consumables and so on. But um, coming back to this question, I think overall um, it is improving. Yes, I think it's um, very important that we have um, a concerted effort to focus mm -hmm. on glaucoma and um, hopefully we'll have more partners and um, key players that are ensuring that these things are placed where they're needed. Uh, Professor Ajola, I would also like to ask you a question here. It's from Chike Emedike. He is an optometrist working in the Nigeria Child Eye Health Project, you know, which is um, basically folk run by the CBM, I think, and um, some other key NGOs in the country. Um, he's from Cross River State in Nigeria. In his own words, um, he says, when assessing a child in a low resource setting, if the clinician suspects glaucoma based on the optic nerve head appearance and cop disc ratio, what is the best line of action to proceed? Especially bearing in mind that um, an investigative assessment is far-fetched in, in such children. Professor Adiola. Thank you very much. We do know that childhood glaucomas sometimes behave differently from adult glaucomas. Now, just mere seeing um, a large disc in a child um, does not necessarily mean that that child has glaucoma. We need to look at other parts of the eye, other structures. You measure the cornea because you have to be sure of the diagnosis first. You need to do the um, cornea diameter and look in the angles if the angle is deformed or you have problems you know identifying structures in the angle and there is problem at the level of the cornea megaloconia yes definitely that is congenital glaucoma and we do know that for congenital glaucoma the primary congenital glaucomas the intervention that is definitive is surgery you need to do goniotomy except for so, late stage you need to do trabeculectomy for them. So what I'm saying in essence is there are actually certain conditions that might be misdiagnosed as congenital glaucomas in children. So you need to do a detailed assessment. Sometimes you might have to actually sedate the child. You need to obtain the intraocular pressure from the child. Bearing in mind that some of those drugs you give them may actually affect the intraocular pressure. So all this you to take into consideration. So uh, that's, um, that, that's my take. But diagnosis must be made. Um, you have to be able, you must be able to check the pressure. Now we have eye care tonometers, which you can use readily in children. And it's portable, you know, you can carry it around. And you don't even need to give a general anesthetic to the child. You can just give um, um, this sedative. It's, it's escaped me now that you give to them, you can either give it to them orally, or you give an injection, and you can check the intraocular pressure quickly. If the pressure so is normal- So um, the, the, basically, the child has to be properly diagnosed. That's the key message now in this situation. That is the message with childhood glaucoma. Yes, so I'd like to continue with um, Heiko, please. Um, what are the factors that will determine which treatment choice to opt for? In, because we have so many treatment options. There's medicine, there's surgery, there's laser. Even though we know that the options are not so, you know, available all over in um, Africa, for example. So can you tell us about um, the treatment options and um, how do we start the treatment? Mm -hmm. Heiko. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, if we think overall, what do we want to achieve with treatment? It's typically we want to avoid uh, loss of visual function to a level that it will affect um, the life or quality of life of our patients. And that should happen at a cost which doesn't um, affect his um, life or quality of life either. So, and, and cost not just in monetary terms, also in terms of time, side effects, complications or other aspects. And we, we basically have a three modalities uh, to reduce pressure. It's, it's mainly um, eye drops, laser and surgery, and we will come back to that later. And one important aspect, I think, is the timing. When do we meet the patient? Is it 
a patient at an overall low risk for progression with early or moderate disease, which might not or only very slowly progress, as opposed to patients at high risk, young patients already with very advanced disease, family history, maybe exfoliation, depending on the region, um, high pressures um, from from far distances might not never come back. And so we, we roughly often have patients from, from these two groups, which then determine our treatment and choices. Overall, there's no one size fits all. There's no um, treatment which helps everybody with no exceptions. It's, it's always um, an individual decision, which might also change over time. Yes, um, in the words of Sa Penko, who, you know, he mentioned yesterday, just yesterday at the lecture, he said we would like to have an ideal treatment that will bring the IOP down to 10 to last at least 10 years, and this yeah. should be done in 10 minutes. So it's mm -hmm. like 10, 10, 10. I found that quite interesting. Um, so I think, um, Heiko, you know, can you please give us information based on your research and what we know from the literature, you know, on the choice of treatments and, you know, the available treatments, the medicines, the surgery, the different types of surgery and um, the lasers? Mm. Yeah, starting with, with medicine or eye drops or treatment, we, uh, it, there's a high barrier um, accessibility of drops, I would say, but Timolol is widely available in the in the region and Timolol is actually a, a fairly good agent. There are huge studies comparing um, also meta-analyses and comparing Timolol with uh, prostaglandins and others and the difference is about two maximum three millimeter mercury in pressure reduction which can be important of course on the other hand if um, the patient can't access uh, prostaglandins or they are too expensive. Timolol is definitely still a good and important agent. Uh, of course, you need to check for asthma or other um, systemic um, challenges, which would in, um, for, yeah, make it more difficult um, to use Timolol or, or would make it impossible. Um, then when it comes maybe um, continuing yeah, with, with surgery, um I, I I know from from studies and our own experience in Tanzania that trabecolectomy is still can be a very efficient um, procedure and it's probably still the gold standard if it is done well and ideally also um, with anti um, anti scarring agents um, 5fu or white MMC um, and also in Nigeria, um, and there are reports of very good results on trabecolectomy. Um, I, I, I think often the challenge is, is training here. Um, there are not so many uh, training opportunities. And I, I also hope in the future there will be more training available. Um, other possibilities are tubes, and we have the Aravin tube. Um, I personally do not have much experience with it, but um, from what, what I've heard so far, it seems to work well, but there are no studies yet done. So I think that is an area which should be explored more in detail if it would make sense to use tubes in, in certain cases. Um, the minimally invasive um, glaucoma procedures um, they overall, it seems the evidence is not very compelling that they are superior to other surgical interventions, but usually they add uh, a considerable additional cost. Um, I once heard in a talk roughly, depending on the device, but you, you're talking about 500 US dollar per um, surgery, and that, that can be a challenge obviously all over the world in, in any region, I would say. And and at the moment, um, yeah, there there are some gains here and there, but overall, um, it's, it's an, another individual decision if it's worth um, to do a procedure. And, oh, okay, what do you say about yeah. um, you know the micro devices? You know the s small devices that how the cost of 
the devices and how available is it in Africa and whether we should, you know, go towards using that more. Yeah. So um, as far as I know, there are not many studies done. Sheila Marco did one in, in Nairobi, for example, and she also concluded that there's is not um, a, a compelling difference between trabeculectomy and um, the device she used and also others and availability is limited um, um, as as far as i have re experienced it in east africa i don't know what you experienced in nigeria obviously yes, Adriana, you, you can always, you tell us? Yeah. i know um i foundation hospital had a course last month with the mix what do you say about the use of mix Adiola. yes um with mix at least for the short um, experience we have, it's actually um, working for us, for our patients, with good pressure lowering. Um, we had the Kahook dual blade, uh, goniotomy, and also we did um, the tubes, using the oral lab tubes, and the patients that had the intervention, they are doing very well, pressures are lowered. And in addition, and even the Zen gel, they also had some Zen gel. But for some of them, some are expensive, you know, maybe difficult to come about. But things like the Kahumbra blade and the Neotomy, in fact, those ones, we can even um, adapt what we have to do. So we have so, um, key issues here now. The skills? Yes. The skills, um, which you know, can I think can ophthalmologists be easily trained on that, and then the availability and cost. Yes, and, you know, the, those the, are the things that would determine whether we should expand on those. Yes, um, the training. Yes, uh, I mean, some people were trained during that workshop, and I'm sure from that workshop, they have started doing the procedure. Like I said, that for Zengel, you know, we may not be able to get those now, but for the oral lab tubes, you know, we're likely to have it at a much lower cost. And then the, for the Kahook dual blade, even if you don't have the Kahook dual blade, we have been trained that you can actually use the 25 gauge needle to do whatever you want to do. Ditto the goniotomy, you know, just to remove it. And um, we, we, that, that, that would be useful to us. It's just to get trained in that, you know, how to actually do it. And then we can then use the appropriate technology we have. We don't have to wait until we get the Kahoot dual blade or we then keep saying that it's rather expensive. I believe it's something we can do. And that's where we Heiko. can hope. Mm -hmm. Heiko, so, um, I know you have been doing some um, laser randomized control trial with SLT. And um, well, the big study from Morfields just was just published in this, you know, earlier this month. So, what do you say about the lasers, the SLT? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the team at uh, Kasim was um, or is still doing a trial, and we are currently um, analyzing the first year um, results, which um, which will be out hopefully also within this year. So I, I don't have the final res results, but so far our gut feeling is that in some patients the SLT laser actually works very well. Um, in most of the patients, better than um, Timolol if you, if you use same conditions. And in some patients, but it, it doesn't work at all. In some patients it works well and then the effect fades after a couple of months. So we, be, we will need to finish, finish the analysis to, to be a bit more specific, but it's definitely a good addition to the mix of treatments. Again, it's also not one size fits all. The laser doesn't treat and um, help everybody, but I would say an SLT laser has the potential to be an important addition to the mix and uh, choice of treatments. Of course, mm, we also have... Yeah, we are the factor of cost, and um, so probably it, it will be cost effective in the rather um, high volume centers which see a lot of 
glaucoma patients. Okay, I have a question here from Dr. Rosalind Duke from Nigeria. Um, Haiku, could you help us answer this? She says, what is the efficacy of using the MP laser probe for treatment of um, primary open angle glaucoma in adults? And what are the long-term complications? Mm -hmm. Just a quick recap on this. Yeah, so we, we I never use just the MP laser uh, probe myself, but it's a, obviously it's a similar principle, uh, like the SLT of this sub, so-called sub-threshold um, treatment, which is very interesting. You don't see much of an effect. We also we we didn't have any major complications, which is probably also true for the MP laser probe. And with the micropulse laser probes, there weren't many studies in the past, although it's out for a couple of years now, but. Um, also, just recently, um, I think there was is a, a study in the Journal of Glaucoma, which gave them also fail, favorable results. And, and there was also, I think, was just a survey um, coming out, which also described positive results. So I guess the whole area of sub-threshold treatment, um, which is, is now out there for a couple of years, and we need to adapt it for the Africa region and see how is it working, how is it accepted by our patients and and health professionals, and how how can we also um, create business models so it makes sense to use them. Professor Adiola, um, Abba Haidara from the Gambia also asks, um, what is your opinion on the role of micropulse cyclo G6 laser? as part of the expanding glaucoma management options. Um, as not every case may be suitable for surgery or medical treatment, and but we still need to be to maximize the treatment. Okay. Now the cyclo, um, the G6, um, that's a new treatment, the cyclodiode, and it's low, it's low heat, just like the SLT2 that is low heat. I have found it very useful. Um, from the workshop, we had some patients who came uh, that we did it for, and I've monitored them. The pressures have been uh, at the low level. In fact, some of them came with pressures in the 30s, and I've seen them consistently now in the last one month, and the pressure has remained low. I mean, until when we follow them for a long time, but I do know that for the immediate pressure lowering, it works. That's the G6 probe. And the advantage over the older method of the cyclodiode is, is not as damaging. You don't have much of side effects or the complications that patients suffer from, from the initial cyclodiode, the, um, I think the G6 probe. That is more damaging because of the heat. But this is low heat and is, is, is not as uh, destructive as what you so have. So I'd like to have it um, included in the options. Yeah. Oh, the that's options. Good. Um, I but think, the, um, Fatima, the only problem yes. I have with it is the probes. The probes, okay. it is time. You can only use it for an hour, and it is expected that within that period of one hour, you do as many as six. And after the six cases, that's the end of that probe. You need to get a new one. And we know that in Africa, that is not sustainable. So that's the only problem I have with it. Otherwise, oh. it's one of the things we can add into a criterion of surgical intervention in glaucoma. So we'll continue with our discussion of trying to keep the patient in the care system. We have made the, um, the patient aware of their disease, the diagnosis, mm -hmm. and the choice of treatment. How do we keep them in the care system on treatment? How do we get them to trust us so that they maintain their treatment? Um, Heiko, can you tell us, you told us about choice of treatment, can you tell us about counselling for support or for choice of treatment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the, the most important aspect of, of our um, of treatment efforts is that the patient understands A, the disease and then B, is involved in the choice of treatment, which can be very challenging and it's also typically not a like a one-off exercise, we explain in three sentences the problem and then he remembers this for the rest of his life, but it's ongoing and needs to be repeated. I always find it very helpful 
um, to have a have a counselor who has more time and also is maybe somehow closer to the patient uh, to explain things again, to discuss um, questions and misunderstandings and so on. So I think key is um, to involve the patient uh, in, in the in the treatment um, efforts as much as possible. Yeah, so counselling is very important. I think a counsellor has to be part of the glaucoma care team. Uh, Professor Adiola, you, you already talked to us about patient care associations and um, how they feature. Can you tell us a bit more on, um, you know, follow up mechanisms? How do we ensure that we keep them in the, you know, we follow them up? And yeah, why if, how do patients um, drop out? How can we keep them? If we adopt a patient-centered management system, you know, as Hiko said, you know, let them have a satisfying hospital experience, be kind to them, be nice to them, explain to them that this is a treatment that is lifelong. You know, each time they come, you know, let them know that this is not the end of it. You have to keep at it and we keep encouraging them. Of course, through the patient, the Okuma Patient Care Association, you keep educating them. And then the other issue is that of counseling, ensure that every patient that comes in get counseled. And then we also need patients who are very good, very compliant patients, you know, even especially those who have had surgery. We can use them as glaucoma ambassadors to go into the community so that they, they will own that awareness and they do it themselves. That way, you know, you can keep more patients in the system. And this patient will be in the forefront. You know, they will be the one even doing the counseling because if you have a glaucoma patient being the counselor, he can feel the pain of the patient in front of him or her, you know, and that way we can keep more patients in the system. And another way is to follow them up. You know, now we've talked about um, electronic uh, medical record system. That way we can have their telephone numbers remind them, give them a call to let them know, we have not seen you in six months, you have to come for your appointment, or we can send text messages. At least we can send text messages, yeah. We yes, all have to yes. That's where yes. we can keep it and letting Very them important. in advanced country. You know, there's a way in which you can actually measure if your patient is getting the medication. You know, they have insurance, like in the US, they have the insurance system, whereby you can actually know from the pharmacist if the patient is coming to collect the medication since they have insurance. Here, it is difficult for us to know if your patient is actually buying that medication because all the patients are using it. Yes, the patient just comes with a bottle on the day of the appointment. You never can tell whether a patient just started using it a few days before the appointment. Yeah. So we, This we, um, time of the follow-up is very important to check for very progression cool. of disease I and to review follow. treatment. Heiko? Heiko? Yeah, yes. Um, check, how, check for progression of disease at this stage? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I was lucky enough to have most of the time had a visual field available. With I always like to do at least uh, once a year or if there's any suspicion for progression, maybe depending on the pressure, also to do it a bit more often. And if if a visual field is, is not available, eye pressure can be a surrogate, but again, it needs to be also uh, taken carefully. Sometimes uh, eye pressures can be misleading, so it should be repeated, I think, before a decision, for example, is made to do topiculectomy. Um, so, that, and you can, in terms of progression, especially in severe disease, um, you can always ask the patient um, just to add information to the question if there's progression or not. Overall, I think to detect progression, which basically means we need to increase treatment. This can be often difficult, and I hope also in the future we have better um, devices, um, tablet-based, smartphone-based devices, um, possibly coupled also with artificial intelligence algorithms, which assist in the detection of progression. Uh, but in the end, obviously, it boils down to the clinician's experience and, and also the patient's um, experience to know if there's a progression or not. 
Yes, I, I think um, we have actually covered um, the care pathway from, you know, not knowing glaucoma up to diagnosis, treatment and um, follow up. So one of the things we also recognized in um, glaucoma care is that there really isn't any clarity. So uh, we are a group of African, you know, glaucoma specialists and ophthalmologists are coming together to develop the clinical tools for, you know, reaching a diagnosis, which is like a checklist, a risk calculator dealing with um, specific situations in glaucoma such as cataract with glaucoma, and then how to you know, linking up to web links and mechanisms on how to do certain things and uh, follow up mechanisms. So basically, um, the toolkit is also going to be looking at setting up a glaucoma care system and program. We'll tell you more about this in time. It's not fully developed yet. Um, I think we should just um, keep developing good relationships and networks with people responsible for health policy and planning so that we can also focus on glaucoma at the local and national levels in our countries. Uh, there's uh, going to be a massive online course on glaucoma presented by the ICH and LSHTM. Uh, glaucoma network is in the making. And then we keep discussing, we keep discussing about glaucoma. So please visit the World Glaucoma Week 2019 to look at to look out for activities in your area. At, at the end, we agree that everybody matters. So let's all walk talk. Thank you very much for listening. Um, uh, Adiola, can you give us your last cap cap up, Professor Adiola? Yes, just as you have said, the talk. We've talked many times. Over the time, now is the time for action. Now we know everybody matters. Let us all play our role in ensuring that we beat the invisible glaucoma. Thank you. Heiko? Oh, yeah. Can you tell us your last? Sorry. Uh, yes. So I totally agree. Um, let's all walk the talk and let's, let's include the patient as, as close as possible when we walk the talk. With him. Yes. Th Simon. Fatima. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, I will hand over the discussion to Simon now. Well, thank you to our lectures. Lectures that has been a, an incredibly comprehensive discussion on glaucoma, and and I'm quite sure every one of our, our audience members has learned a great deal from it. Um, we have had a few questions come in, and. Uh, And her question is, can you elaborate on what simple can be used by community health workers aside from visual acuity to help early detection of glaucoma in the community? Uh, Jola, can you answer that? Did you get the question? Um, for the community eye health workers in the community? Yes. Apart from visual acuity. Well, we can, we can teach them. You, of course, we can have visual acuity cut off, but we can also teach them pupillary reaction because at that level, they may not pick a patient with 0 0.5, 0 0.6. What you don't want are patients who are going blind. In fact, you teach them about pupil. You talk about black pupil. You know, a dilated pupil would never react. All they are seeing is just a black, you know, they just see the, the lens. And when the people is reactive, you just ask them to repair because it means yes. that patient has an optic nerve damage in one eye, and that way we can save the other eye. As well. So apart from the visual acuity, you teach them about pupillary reaction, and then you can also teach them how to assess the intraocular pressure. We have a Thank lot you. of home uh, tonometers now, even though it might take a while before we get home, but at least. Assessing pupillary reaction is one good way because it's a function of the doctor. Yes, thank you very much. Simon, any more questions, please? Um, we have another question. Uh, this is from Dr. Bature from the National Eye Center, Kaduna, Nigeria. And his question is Has neuroprotection proven effective in Africa? Mm. Studies has been. 
Yeah, well, um, researches have to be done. We need to carry out research on that. It's difficult to say no or to say yes. You know, we are science. We really have to prove it. And it will mean uh, carrying out um, clinical trials with the neuro. That's the bottom line. I think we need more um, research yeah. for treatment of glaucoma in Africa. Heiko, what do you say? Yeah, I that? totally agree. I'm not aware of any um, study in the Africa region to oh, check no, for neuro no. protection. No, so it's difficult to say really. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not, not for glaucoma at least. Okay, Simon. Thank you very much. That um, I think I think we are coming to the end of our our session. Um, it it has been a very full hour, and thank you for 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 the presentation and for answering answering our questions, both from the live audience and also from from those those questions that came in earlier. Um, I'd like to wrap up by thanking our presenters, Dr. Fatima Kiari, Dr. Adiola. On, on Onakoyo and Dr. Heko Philippine for their comprehensive presentations and responses to all the questions. Thank you specifically to my colleague Emma in the global office for arranging this webinar, for all your technical support and for catching us every time, you know, in case we get dropped. Uh, and thank you to everybody who's participated. We really appreciate appreciate you all taking the time to to be part of this um, focus on glauco glaucoma webinar. We hope you've learned something today. And um, for, for more information on the subject, please drop us a line. And for more information on the IPB's uh, campaign focus on glaucoma, please visit our website uh, to learn more about the various activities and see how you can become involved. As I said earlier, uh, if you visit the website in the coming days, you'll, you'll, you'll have access to a recording of the webinar as well as the slides. In a few moments, you'll, you'll receive a, a survey uh, it, it'll be emailed to you directly from a go-to meeting where, uh, email address, and we hope that you'll just take a few short minutes to complete it so that we can learn a little more about what you like and perhaps what, what, what you'd like to hear more of and what you'd like to hear less of. Um, so thank you to everybody. I can tell you now that we had uh, 51 people on this call. That includes the panel, and that is a good number for us. So please keep an eye out for the next IPB webinar. Uh, but for now, that's it from us. So thank you to all. Take care and bye-bye. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye.